Hold on. Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Pinecker, and I am very excited today, folks, to do a very, very special episode of Mormon Book Reviews. I haven't done this before. I gave you a little teaser earlier tonight that I have somebody who was intimately involved in the project of identifying, uh, knowing the discoverer of the Joseph Smith photo that just was released yesterday. And this is what's so exciting. It's uh, Lachlan McKay. First of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. And John Hamer, you're my color commentary t commentator tonight. Uh, how are you doing today? <laughs> Very, very good. Happy to be with you. It's a fun, fun thing to be talking about. It's very exciting news. That's obviously been exciting to lots of people. Yes. And I am just, um, I don't know. I think I'm just head over heels that it's this channel, 14 months old is doing this and it's really exciting. And I know there's a lot of podcasters out there, but thank you. I appreciate it. So I just want to give you a little background on Locke. Uh, Locke is, uh, he's with the community of Christ. He's an apostle. He is a direct descendant of Joseph Smith. He's a director of the historical sites for the church and is also part of the church history team. And of course, I another person I really enjoy uh, interacting with is Barbara Walden a lot. Uh, she, she works with you a lot too, right? She does. She's one of our three world church historians with David Hallett and Ron Romig, who co-wrote the article that we'll talk about tonight. Okay. So I haven't had a chance to read the article yet. I've read a little bit of uh, um, news out there, but I kind of just went in this like, okay, I'm just going to ask some questions that are obvious here. I guess the first thing is let's let's talk about how in the world this thing was identified 28 years ago, was thought to be a pocket watch all this time. And just two years ago, it was, somebody opens it up, talk about him. And then I also have follow up to that is how the heck were you guys able to keep it a secret? <laughs> yeah, that's a, a two good questions. So uh, March of 2020, um, I got a call from my uncle, Dan Larson. Dan is the son of Lois Smith Larson. Um, so Dan's my mother's brother. Lois Smith Larson was Frederick Madison Smith's daughter. And Lois and her husband, Edward, and their large family lived on Frederick Madison Smith's farm. Fred M. Smith, a, an RLDS prophet. Uh, and of course, Fred M. was Joseph Smith III's son, who was Joseph and Emma's son. So when Fred died, the farm passed to my grandmother. And I believe that likely simply personal effects that were there passed as well. So I don't believe that my grandmother knew that she had this object, or at least what it was. Let me put it that way. Um, so she gave, apparently, to my Uncle Dan in 1992, a number of family objects, one of which was Joseph Smith III's monogrammed pocket watch. And the other was another object that looks, when closed, just like a watch. There were some other things as well. Dan couldn't get um, the second object to open when he pushed the, the release button. It was slightly bent. Um, and, but he just assumed it was a watch. Uh, he took the stuff home and put them away and, and forgot about it for 28 years. And like so many of us, as the pandemic struck, uh, maybe had a little extra time and was uh, sorting through some stuff and uh, found it. And this time he was able to get it open and discovered that it was not a watch, but rather something that's sometimes called a watch locket. Uh, so again, oh. it looks just like a wa watch from the outside, pocket watch, but inside in this case is a daguerreotype. Um, Okay, so before we talk about how you kept it a secret, how did he, what tool did he use to pry it open with? I don't know. Well, I wasn't there. So right. I, I think he was just eventually able to get the release mechanism to work. Um, but um, so that's my understanding. But uh, yeah, Absolutely. it's more fun if you had to pry it open. Yeah, I imagine. <laughs> Absolutely. So I guess then my second question was how did the, I guess, this must have been like top secret uh, community of Christ. How did this happen? How yeah, were you able so, to keep this a secret? Yeah. So um, with Dan's permission, I reached out to Ron Romig, who's spent more than 30 years researching Smith family visual images. And for a lot of those years, I was working with Ron on that. So we already had a pretty significant background in studying daguerreotypes. 
by no means do I consider myself a daguerreotype expert. Let me just say that. But, um, and we concluded early on because of some, um, well, we just decided it was best if everything was in writing. Uh, so we have um, non-disclosure agreements. Uh, we agreed that we would let um, Dan see our research if he would let us uh, research the object, but that none of us could do anything without uh, the permission of the other. Um, so that started the process and it was very difficult to find qualified people to, to assist early on because everything was shut down in March of 2020, April. Nobody wanted to, to let anybody into their house or business. Very, very difficult. Uh, but through a friend who works at the Nelson um, Art Gallery in Kansas City, um, she helped me connect with a curator who helped me connect with somebody who had the skill set we needed in the Kansas City area, who um, eventually agreed to meet with Dan and started to examine the locket. We concluded pretty early on that we should disassemble it to see if there were maker, maker marks or you know, a name or a date, or we were hoping that it would be pretty simple to solve. Uh, but um, so they, they found a very talented miniaturist who was able to, to carefully disassemble it. So take, take it all apart. Wow. There, there were no maker's marks or names or dates, um, but it, it is a, a 16th plate daguerreotype stamped or cut out round. And then it has a glass cover attached to it to protect it. Um, so and every time we pulled somebody in, we also, before we talked to them, put a non-disclosure agreement in place. Uh, so that, I think, is why we, we made it. Although um, I was getting a little nervous near the end. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'll bet. I, I, had a bunch of, I had a bunch of people who IM'd me at the end because they, they noticed that I have my name on some of the graphics in the journal article. And they said, how on earth? Did, how on earth did you keep the secret? <laughs> you know? and I said, well, you know, I mean, they only they only brought me in in February of this year, but uh, you know, it was very much we said there's non-disclosures and all that kind of thing, and and it's better, even as I think we've already seen because of the release of this that it, since it instantly you know causes a social media firestorm, which everything always does these days, um, and then people all have all these reactions without uh, just the image, and their reactions are primarily based on I guess whether they think it looks like the painting or whatever their own personal image of it, of, of what Joseph Smith is supposed to look like. You know, in other words, we know that that kind of thing was going to you know, immediately happen. And so you want to have that, the backup of all of the research that Locke and Ron did in order to lay out what the actual provenance of this object is. So it's not just some random photo that they have found and said, oh, that kind of looks like Joseph Smith or something like that, but rather so that you have that in place so that people can have the evidence to actually assess as opposed to just the very surface kind of social media response that always happens. John, while, while we're talking, I'm just curious, what did it feel like to be able to see the picture? Like, hey, we got something to show you. What, 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 what were your emotions at the time? Um, well, I, I liked the idea of it. I, I was there was another picture that had been, you know, shopped around a decade, a couple of decades ago, I guess in the 90s, which didn't have that provenance that they thought maybe had Smith family connections, but it turned out, I guess, that it really doesn't is my kind of, I'm, I'm not an expert on that one, but anyway, that Ron and Locke actually spent a bunch of time looking into it too, I think back in the uh, the 90s. And so that one I've never, uh, and I've never thought had enough association to, to make a lot of sense. I'm generally with these kinds of um, finds fairly skeptical. So like usually, um, you know, there's all of these things where people would love to find something about, you know, the historical Jesus. So they, they find the, the gospel of Jesus's wife, a, you know, a, you know, a, a per, if what ends up proving to be a pretty, um, pretty obvious uh, forgery of a, you know, a Coptic papyrus or whatever that's that's kind of based on da Vinci Code style uh, sensationalism, or you know this this thing of finding a mausoleum of Jesus's family or something like that, because because it says Jesus is Joseph and on some of some of these tombs, uh, and so I, my feeling on those kind of things is it's very unlikely we're going to find anything about the historical Jesus because of how you know how famous the guy was compared you know in the three centuries after his death compared to how little um, actual um, 
archaeological footprint or anything that he would have had in, in his actual lifetime. In other words, everybody was pretty desperate in the fourth century to find anything they could find, and there's very unlikely to find anything subsequently, you know. Um, and, then, and so for this thing, too, you know, it's sort of like, well, we, we know that from the notes and from published things that daguerreotypes were taken, I think. And there's a, there's been, that sort of idea has been known, but then there's been the complexity of the this problem of we have the painting and they took some daguerreotypes of the painting and they made some semi-photographic looking images that people got confused about, you know, kind of at the time. And so actually, you know, so actually being able to find this, um, you know, the, the main question that kind of was in front, that I kind of felt was in front of me is this, how, how much can we actually see you know, where did this, you know, where was this head hid and where, how did this object, you know, come down to, you know, through the family and so forth. And that, that's the part that was very compelling to me. So, so I guess the, um, the emotions of it were sort of like, I, um, I'm probably was like everybody else who initially said, well, I kind of really have the portrait in my head and the portrait is full on a front view. And so, and, and, and so is this. And then, and then the other issue of it is, that I think that Joseph Smith's main features that were that really stood out to everybody um, really are seen when you do this, <laughs> you know. And so, so when you do the profile view, you see, uh, you know, like my when I, I have an ancestor who um, or family member who was who was a friend of Joseph Smith's and was uh, alive and young at the time, and he went on Zion's camp and so forth. He later uh, he later was an apostle under Sidney Rigdon, and he, and he became a a spiritualist and kind of an anti-Mormon at the end of his life. And he wrote like a bunch of reminiscences to the Salt Lake Tribune. And he says, as he's out visiting the Salt Lake Tribune in the, in the 1880s or something, he says, I've seen all these images that you guys have of Joseph Smith. And I'll tell you, they flatter him a lot because he doesn't look that good. <laughs> you know, he was, you know, he had a, he had a very, you know, pronounced kind of not, it's not, it's not his nose and, and his forehead sloped really back. And he was, he was vain, but he wasn't, wasn't good looking. You know, he was charismatic, but not, not, a, not, handsome or whatever is what he's kind of saying and so I kind of had that have had that in my head and so the certainly the uh, the Maudsley profile ones are kind of the ones that really um, have stood out as me as being very very how I kind of personally have envisioned Joseph Smith and so the thing about a, a portrait like this where you have a photograph is a lot of people think cameras don't lie but actually there's a lot of ways that cameras do lie so even if so one of the things is well we just don't people a lot of people immediately say I don't think there's enough nose here you know, to have to get the Smith nose, but the when you have the straight on view of the nose, that's when you're seeing the least of it, you know, and, and so, so especially if you're upturn a little bit, whereas a portrait painter knows he's got this real nose and so you paint it big, even if it doesn't necessarily look like that in the if you were to take a photo, I don't know. So, so I had those same kind of personal reactions where I thought, well, I don't know if it really looks like it, but for me, the, the question was, um, in the same way that I think it's very unlikely to ever find anything from the historical Jesus anymore, um, that, that how you could find an artifact like this, it almost, this is almost the only way that it can be, which is to say, locked away in a, um, in a relic that is important to the Smith family, that Smith family in recent generations has not been aware of what's in it, but that you can actually trace and kind of identify through the preceding generations back to Emma's lifetime, at least. And so, um, anyway, so that's what that so that made it pretty remarkable. And then I was pretty I was like, well, the neat thing about it at that point is, is if we start to come to think, okay, yeah, maybe this really is the image of it. Then you start to say, it's kind of neat to take this founder and just be able for once to really see a, a real human person as opposed to someone who's only mythic, a person who is only, you know, painted like. Like Jesus or something, because there's no photos, obviously, you know. So, <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, Locke, I need to let's talk now about the process of identifying um, the photograph. Uh, apparently, you guys went through a process and look at different uh, points, references, and compared them to the paintings and other images of him. And I guess some of these, like a 95% certainty or something, that this is him. Maybe just detail that for us. Yeah, um, I'm not sure I would. I think one of them came back with a 90% probability that that was more subjective of, of forensic law enforcement person from California with four dec decades of experience. He did a lot of things like feature tracing and then laying those images on top. Um, so you, you trace all the features of the daguerreotype, then lay them on the death mask and lay them on the portrait. Uh, really is a surprisingly good match, except the portrait painter for both Joseph and Emma 
made their nose too long um, and made their mouth a little too narrow and the lips a little too fine. And that was apparently a not uncommon thing at the time. They would paint um, intentionally to make you look what was considered to be uh, attractive at the time. So more refined. Um, so, but fits wow. really well. Uh, and then things like 50-50 um, cutaways, um, oh, transparencies on top of each other uh, really looks, looks pretty good. And then we used uh, a company out of New Hampshire to do some facial recognition applications. Now, facial recognition works best when you have multiple known photographs of a person and you're then testing another photo against them. So this is kind of a, uh, on the edge of what facial uh, is capable of doing, I think. But we were all we had to work with was uh, the daguerreotype, the death mask, and the um, painting. Uh, and they came back with 19 of 21 points within the 5% realm. Um, and in, in their methodology, and this is uh, objective, not subjective, but in their methodology, uh, 19 of 21 points is a moderate relationship, which apparently in facial recognition is, is a positive outcome. Um, it's, it's definitely not, um, it's a perfect match, but you wouldn't expect it to be. And especially because we're looking at uh, a daguerreotype with two pieces of art. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, now, um, one of the things that was interesting for me was I looked at, the, as soon as I looked at the photo and I saw the image of the painting and I saw the photo, I looked at the hairline. And to me, it was absolute dead on. And I thought, see, my theory was some artists are really good at noses. Some are really good at ears, getting them right. And some, this guy was just really good at getting his hairlines right. You want to see the two with these next two? I can share that. Oh yeah, let's do that. Let's go. Does that do it? There we go. So yeah, even yeah. in terms of that, you know, like like Lack was pointing out, like in terms of the where the hair is falling over the two ears, you know, because on the one ear, you know, on uh, his left, you know, the hair comes down farther, right? In both. Yeah. I... We can see things like a marionette line beginning on the right side of his mouth. So that little line starting to come down in the portrait on the right, and there it is in the portrait. There's there's some kind of a, um, a, a a bump, a deformity. I don't know, but under his left lip, there's an area that seems somewhat enlarged. I think uh, I can see that in both. Uh, his left lower eyelid is is heavy. I see that in both. Um, even things. Um, it, it took a dentist to point this out to me that when you zoom in, the uh, is that the full filtrum, I forgot, uh, under your nose, the, the, the tip of one side of the lip is just slightly higher than on the other side. Um, so pretty amazing detail that I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that an artist would capture that. Um, you know, maybe it's coincidental, but it, it, it's there. And for me, what really captured me was the, the frown line, the off-centered frown line, which I had never even noticed on the portrait before just one of them uh, near his left eyebrow. And there it is yeah. in the aerotype. And I think we can see it in the death mask as well, but we need to actually see that in person. Um, but it seems to be there in, in some of the photographs. Yeah, I, I think that there's, it's just, you know, and this is the thing too, what I thought was interesting was, uh, I, I guess the Emma had, there, and then tell me if this is apocryphal or not, but I read somewhere that Emma didn't like the picture that was taken of Joseph. And she she didn't she wasn't too crazy about it. And I thought, you know, if this picture, if he looked better than the painting, then we know that it probably wasn't him. The fact that he doesn't look as good as the it looks and maybe I don't know, I think they look pretty similar, tells me that maybe that's another, you know, check off for authenticity. Yeah. So I, I don't have the quote memorized, but she's basically saying nobody could capture his likeness because uh -huh. it was changing all the time. Uh, so she was saying it isn't a particularly good likeness um, and that nobody would be able to get it because it's always different <laughs> huh. yeah uh, and joseph apparently said of said of it um you know it, it doesn't look much like a prophet of the lord and more like a, a 
you know, green farm boy or something like that. That's not the exact quote, but something to that effect. You know, it was so funny. I heard people commenting, you know, the social commentary and people were like, this guy looks like a guy in his forties. And I'm thinking, yeah, but it's the wilderness. It's a harder life in existence. People I'm imagine probably look, and people often up until recently always seem to look older than their age. You know, now, even in pictures from the 1920s, somebody from that's 25 years old looks like they're 35. Yeah. I haven't had a chance to post it yet, but every time I see one of those, uh, uh, notes. Uh, I've got Emma in an 1842 portrait, the companion to Joseph, Emma in an 1845 daguerreotype. Uh, she's been through a lot between 42 and 45, but she looks at least 10 and maybe 15 years older in the 45 daguerreotype. And yes, some of that would be the stress, but some of it I think is the painter painted them young. <laughs> um, so if, if you look at Emma portrait and Emma 45 daguerreotype, I think that that folks will quit talking about. I think he looks too old. Okay, excellent point, John. It, well, no, especially yeah, because it, it because Emma looks so uh, prematurely aged by the time we actually get to the photos. Even though we have all these daguerreotype images, we re we rarely use them, and we always prefer to use the portrait because the portrait you know paints her looking strong and like a uh, you know anyway a leader as opposed and then as opposed to somebody who's just world weary and has been worn so worn down by all the things that she had to suffer through and in that sense the part the photos are maybe better in that in conveying that real true story that she had but but we rarely i feel like those rarely get used comparatively we almost always see the painting right mm -hmm. yep yep and it's and it, it i have had some people pushing back saying it's not him and there's an emotional because everybody has everybody has in their mind what jesus looked like and everything and you know, I always say it's like, you know, we've, we've had such a hagiography of Joseph for most of his history of how he looked. And, you know, just recently and just only in the last 10, 15 years, are we really within the larger context of the LDS church? Are we really starting to grapple with, you know, that he was a human being? And I actually, I look at this picture and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty sure it's him, man. Uh, and there just seems to be so much evidence. And you lack, you know, I asked John, John about his emotional response. You're a direct descendant. What was it like for you to gaze his portrait for the first time? I looked at it and said, oh, I don't think that's Joseph. <laughs> 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 um, because it was slightly um, needed to be straightened and, and there were particular features I were look, was looking for and I didn't see them immediately. But with, with Dan's permission, I sent it to Ron, who I think is much more visually oriented than I and a more thoughtful scholar than I. And, and our work, his research is, is the foundation that then together we built this on. He's been doing this forever. Um, but Ron looked at it and said, I think it could be, we, we need to spend some time on this. Uh, and that kind of launched it. Uh, but even um, you know, from the first day, when I look into those eyes, I just, I see the charisma, um, the, the piercing gaze that, yep. that I think people are describing. Parley P. Pratt talks about, again, it's not an exact quote, but basically how we can, look through your heart and into the eternities. <laughs> and, and I think I see that in this image. Um, and I understand why people would follow him as if they're being driven from Ohio to Missouri to Illinois. And I, I, I kind of get it. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. Yeah. I, I, the, the, you know, I'm still, I, I'm a skeptic. So I guess we're all skeptics, right? And that's probably a good thing. And actually that's really good because obviously that's the best way to uh, authenticate is try to disprove it and use the scientific method. And, uh, I, just r really uh, quickly, how many people uh, up until like recently, how many how many people were like for the first year or so, how many people actually knew about this 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 photo? Uh, I'd have to count it up, but it was it was very, very, very few for the first yeah. year or so. Um, my mom, because she was in the room with me when I opened the email from Dan, <laughs> Kristen, my, my wife, because she was in the room when I opened the email from Dan. Um, and, and really only the people, and, and Dan's spouse, Rosemary, of course, but uh, only the people that were directly involved, and Kristen and Rosemary were quickly involved in, in helping with researching the photographs, uh, that, and they're the ones, Kristen started finding the first uh, image of a prominent Smith woman wearing it. Um, the one we first found was uh, Emma Josepha, um, who's Joseph III's first child, Joseph and Emma's oldest grandchild. They called her Emma J. And she was also given 
by Emma, the bead necklace, the gold bead necklace that Emma is always wearing. So kind of the favorite grandchild is the first. Um, and Emma J had it for decades, decades. Um, you know, I think it just thinks, uh, you know, well, John, uh, let's talk a little bit about you too, because you, uh, of course, uh, designed many of the covers for the John Whitmer Historical Association. Um, and that's how you got involved to be able to find the photo. Just maybe talk in detail the choices you made in making what what was like what what made you decide to frame it the way you did and and did you did you spend a lot of time on it or how did that I'll, look? I'll, I'll, I'll just well thank you for thinking so but uh, i'll just say in this particular case uh you know no i've been i've made i think at this point now uh jwh journal has been going on for a long time but i think i've done more than the majority now of the covers because at a certain point it started they've started publishing two a year and so therefore I rack them up faster than all the people that had done them in pre pre previously and some of these are very are are very artful and I've spent a whole bunch of time on them in terms of what my, what it takes for me in this case this thing made itself okay. you know, because essentially there's the locket you know and I, it was just a matter of me choosing where to crop it and where to put the you know the the JWHA part and, and so forth on, on on it but it was a very um it was a very low impact design task for me uh, as a matter of deciding to the main the other main article in this is um, in this particular issue is Jill Brim's uh, you know lifetime of work on the on the red brick store and she's the outgoing uh, president of the JWHA journal and so wanting to also put the the red brick store image on the on the cover so that's on the back cover because um, uh, that also I mean obviously they, this event took you know, uh, you know, it's a, it's the front cover story, right? So, mm -hmm. and and Jill was very happy. Yeah, she wrote me a very nice letter today. So oh, that's great. And it, so, but yeah. So, uh, in terms of that, I've been I've been I don't know since uh, I think yeah 2005. I've been I've done all the typesetting and design and and uh, interior illustrations and charts and maps and also covers for the JWHA Journal. And so and so that's why. Kind of, I guess, beginning in February, I, I started getting emails from Locke, which was saying, um, "I know you can't keep a secret, but <laughs> 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 but I have to start talking to you, and so if I'm going to tell you this, you've got to keep a secret, <laughs> you know." And, and I'm going to send you a contract that you know is making that clear. And and I, not only is there a contract, but I also I also really mean it. <laughs> so anyway, so I was able to keep a secret. Oh, that's, <laughs> so. that's great. So Locke, are you going to be at Sunstone this year? I will be heading out to Utah, yeah. Okay, so I will be seeing you there. I'm excited about that. Uh, you're going to be a rock star, you realize, when you go there. Mm, I am extraordinarily introverted, so I am not too excited about that. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll try to deflect for you. How's that? You know. <laughs> so um, now, Locke, from my understanding, uh, from the article I read earlier today, you're, you're actually going to be giving a presentation at the Smith Family Reunion next month about this? Yeah, they're... Um... They met for the first time, I think it was 1972, here in Nauvoo. That was the first uh, large Smith family reunion, both um, RLDS and LDS. Uh, and so they're coming back uh, in 2022. They'll be here in the next, oh, I guess, two weeks. So looking forward to that. And then uh, Dan and I, um, and this maybe was one of the, the most emotional parts of, of the whole process, after all these years of, well, two years of working on it, uh, I invited some of my siblings and their children, my mom and stepdad, and uh, Dan brought some of his family together, and we had a, a mini family reunion here in Nauvoo, and the, met in the Nauvoo house, uh, and then kind of unveiled it to everybody. Wow. So that that was an extraordinary experience that was uh, made made all the work worth it. I bet. Man, that's so awesome. And I, I'm so excited for you guys. I think it's great that um, it's the John Whitmer Historical Association Journal that breaks the story. Uh, I just that that's so great to me. And I think it's great that you you lock, you know, being affiliated with the community of Christ. And, you know, you're such an important historic church and have played such a major role in the restoration history. And just a reminder, folks, that John Hamer and I sometime this fall will be actually uh, filming a history of the RLDS uh, slash uh, uh, Community of Christ um, later this fall. Uh, that's a follow up to our series of uh, videos that covered the period from 1820 to 1860 of the history of the church. Um, and um, so that's exciting. So stay tuned for that. 
Uh, Locke, I, I want to ask you, um, you, you, have you guys been getting any pushback? And do you think that any of the pushback you're getting, they're like, is there an argument that somebody's using against the photo that you think is a pretty strong one? Or do you think that you guys have a pretty solid case? So uh, I appreciate pushback because I think that's yeah. how scholarship works. Absolutely. Uh, um, uh, but to this point, the folks who are pushing back haven't read the article. Um, uh, there's probably a few exceptions, but um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of, oh, he looks too old and it's um, a lot of like, he looks like, this looks like it's really Hiram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or this looks like it's, why isn't it Samuel or something? And then I'm kind of like, well, why does Joseph Jr.'s beloved eldest granddaughter hold this as a cherished relic if it's Samuel, <laughs> you yeah. know, or whatever, or William, like people say, why isn't a young version of William or whatever? Well, they didn't like William. <laughs> so I don't think you'd be <laughs> holding this around your heart as a locket if it was William, but anyway. <laughs> so, probably for decades. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm also, also seeing a lot of, it doesn't match the death mask. Um, and and the, the experts that we hired to, to do that, um, it, it matched really extraordinarily well. Um, so I would encourage people read the article and, and then let's, yeah, uh, let's explore. Let, you know, I, I, I look forward to those conversations. I am confident there are people out there. I'm actually relieved that we can now broaden uh, the, the number of folks that are looking at it. And, and I am confident that there is information out there that, that will help us um, continue to understand this object. Yeah, so uh, I can't wait. Now the the journal. I'm a I'm a subscriber. I like reading my books. I don't like PDFs, so I'm waiting for the hard copy to come. Have they been dropped in the mail, or should we be looking for them in our mailboxes? Those who are members of the uh, historical association. I I think so. Should they should be um, if not sent already, they will be being sent out very soon because uh, we wanted to have everything ready to go when the when the news was going to hit, and so before. Um, uh, before Locke, you know, sent out the press releases and so forth, before the, the JWHA sent out the press releases, um, we had it set up so that the journals could, the print copies could be mailed. And so I'm presuming that they have either been ordered or will be begin to be mailed out at this point. But I know that you can, you know, if you're not a member, you can order, you can order a hard copy right now on Amazon. Amazon will ship it to you in just a couple of days. Um, and you can, like you say, if you are less um, like you and me and maybe Locke, and wanting the hard copy, you can also order the e-copy <laughs> and get it immediately. But for people who are already members, it'll come very soon. Good, excellent. And uh, just a, a real quick, Locke, are you going to be giving a presentation of this at the John Whitmer Historical Association, which is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year? Yeah, I am. Ron Roaming and I together will be sharing about it. And I'm especially excited to be able to do that because Kristen, my spouse, is the president this year. So 50 years, Kristen, my wife, is the president. And uh, Get to talk about something I love. Yeah, that's great. Like, somebody asked, is, are you guys, will the artifact actually be able to be there or, or not? I, I would guess not. Um, okay. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think it, it'll be pretty carefully guarded. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. I just was wondering. I, I told, I don't, all I promised people was there would be high resolution images. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yep. So Locke, was there anything else that you wanted to share with our audience tonight? Anything that we didn't get to? Um, probably should talk a little bit more about uh, maybe the artifact itself. That's too. Um, so it, it is consistent. We you know watch lockets are very hard to date because it's, it's not um, a high end object. It's gold plated. They're being mass produced as much as anything was mass produced in, in the 1840s. Um, so nobody has become an expert on them and there's no maker's mark on it, but it's consistent with the period. They are advertising for sale in the Prophet, a church newspaper in New York City, Daguerrean lockets uh, among the supplies that daguerreotypists can buy. And these people are shipping all over the country. Uh, so we know that the locket is available. Um, Lucian Foster, of course, the best candidate, we, we don't know for certain, but He's the New York City branch president. He moves to Nauvoo, arrives two months to the day before Joseph's death. We're not certain that he was a, he had the equipment to take the daguerreotypes prior to Joseph's death, um, but he's the best candidate. Uh, 
And we, in, in the early 90s, I found what's likely the first photograph of Lucy Mack Smith, Joseph's mother. And I found that in Lynn and Lorene Smith's attic. Lynn, a son of Albert A. Smith, who was the son of David H. Smith, Joseph and Emma's youngest son. So in an attic um, a trunk, there was a picture of uh, an envelope full of photographs. The envelope was labeled Mother Smith's Pictures, which in this context was Clara Hartshorn Smith, David Hiram Smith's wife. And in there was a little carte de visite uh, of a piece of Daguerrean jewelry or a coat button, we thought it was initially. So it's a photograph of a daguerreotype. Uh, we now realize that almost certainly what that photograph is of is another Daguerrean locket insert, just like the one in this locket. So that tells us that the Smith family has access to the technology, that they are utilizing that technology. This is that uh, one, right? Yeah, that's it, that's it. Uh, so even the similar pose to the Joseph object, um, the background is similar. You know, I'm not certain, but I think I might even see some similarities in the way it was stamped or cut out. The daguerreotype turned into a, a round plate. Um, and there's a, a painting based on this. It's a copy of this, uh, which I believe is hanging in the Nauvoo Temple by January of 1846. So we know it's at least mid 1840s. Um, so I think that's pretty compelling. Um, what we don't know is how did the locket make, make it from uh, my grandmother's aunt, Emma J, to my grandmother? And we talk about three different paths that might have followed. It, if it continued down the, the prominent Smith female line, Emma J might well have given it to Fred M. Smith's wife, Ruth. Um, again, Fred M. was the president of the church by that point. Ruth tragically killed in a, an automobile accident. Um, and so she gave half of her possessions, her personal effects to one daughter and half to my grandmother. It's possible it passed that way. Might have also passed from Emma J to Fred. And when he dies, then goes to my grandmother among his possessions. I guess it's possible it went directly from Emma J to my grandmother, but I'm, I'm kind of doubtful on that one. But somehow it makes, makes its way to my grandmother from Emma J. Um, so, you know, I, I wish we do have Joseph Smith III saying, uh, I have a daguerreotype of my father, and I believe it was made by, by Foster. Um, he thinks it might have been 42, 43, I think he's off a year or two, uh, but um, Foster was seemingly in Nauvoo in 42. I don't think he stayed, but it, he does appear on a, a land record um, even earlier, so I guess that's possible. Um, but, but Grant Romer, who's probably the expert on daguerreotypes in the U.S., thinks that, that this image probably doesn't date earlier than 43. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, I would just encourage people to read the article. Yep. There's a, a lot of information and do not skip the footnotes. There is really important information in the footnotes. We address the, the 1879 Carson image, which people get confused by and think it's a photograph from life. We address the 1885 Carter image, which people get confused by and think it's a photo from life. Um, they're not. Uh, Carter is a photo of a daguerreotype of the oil portrait. Carson is a photo of the portrait itself. <laughs> Both of them touch him up and sell him. Um, hmm. So read the article, a lot of good stuff in there. Good stuff. And uh, do we have a photograph of Emma actually wearing the locket? We don't have a photograph. And we, there might exist a Sutcliffe Maudsley uh, profile uh, of Emma with the locket. So um, I think it's plate 18 in Stephen Buell's uh, book on Sutcliffe Maudsley, um, B-U-L-E, Stephen Buell, beautiful book that he has done. Plate 18, I think it is, and it is Emma with Alexander, one of her sons, and she is wearing on a ribbon around her neck, tucked into a pocket on her dress, um, an object that is either a pocket watch or a, a watch locket. Uh, not enough detail to know for sure. And Emma is described at her wedding to Louis Biedemann as wearing uh, a pocket watch or a watch on a heavy gold chain. 
which is what we see on Bertha Madison Smith, Joseph III's wife, and on Emma J for two of the three images until late in life, she puts it on a thin chain and wears it as a necklace versus as a heavy chain wearing it like a, a, a locket. Hmm. And we don't, do we have any record um, of journals uh, describing this item at all, maybe talking about it? I mean, it just seems like it's been passed along all along and there, there's no documentation of it. Yeah, so maybe there's a reference from, I think it's Emma J who's talking about it, um, about a watch that, um, that Emma had. And so there's, uh, we're not clear, is she talking about a, a Smith family pocket watch or is she talking about the watch locket? Again, it looks just like a watch when it's closed. Um, uh, so maybe, um, uh, just not, not okay. certain. Okay, that's cool. Hey, John, uh, and, was, was there anything you want to add to this? Um, no, no, I'm just as excited as everybody is about it, but I um, I also agree with Locke, everybody should read the article, <laughs> you know, because I mean, I, almost everything, you know, when people ask to give me different questions is like, well, why is he got in this in the in the photo here or whatever daguerreotype? Why does he have a black tie when he in the portrait other paintings and things? He's wearing a white tie, isn't he? As a minister, isn't he supposed to wear the white tie? And there's a big, long footnote, you know, that describes that he actually owned a black tie. That you know that there were a bunch of different contemporary portraits of you know of some of the other leaders and so forth, where they sometimes wear black ties and sometimes white. So so in other words, that it's totally consistent for him to be having either or. Uh, in, in, in that kind of a context. And so anyway, just almost all of those kind of questions and objections um, are largely, I think, you know, that's something that they've been thinking about since uh, uh, Ron and Locke have been working on this for a couple of years, as they say. And so now, obviously, there are going to be a whole bunch of more scholars and, and um, eyes on this. And so one of the things that happens is, you, you know, the first, first article gets published, and then people may well People may well find other um, other instances, like you say, in journals or letters or something like that. In other words, where they might actually, oh, this might trigger something, and they actually find a reference, and that will come out, or or they will have other kinds of um, uh, evidence or arguments about why why they think that the provenance here it doesn't really work. You know, the 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 gap to get to Locke's grandma or whatever. You know. That's, they, they, they don't think that that's a close enough path, although I don't know what you're wanting for at that point. <laughs> it's in the family. I don't know. In other words, I, for these kind of things, you know, it's, this is almost the one place where I can see we could actually find one of these um, images because it's got to be something closely held, presumably by the family, because it's anything that would have been carted off to Utah you know, you know, has been cataloged a million times in, in the archives of the church headquarters, and they would have found something that's a visual image, you know, so I don't think that they're sitting on anything that they haven't, you know, pried open. Um, I don't know, unless there's something in the Hiram Smith's family where they had, the, you, know, I, you know, what I mean, I don't know. In other words, I, I feel like that this kind of thing can, you know, you have in order to have the provenance, it has to come through the family almost so that you have the connection. And, and also because the families are the ones that are like to preserve stuff that is a, a relic of their family members, but on the other hand, they aren't actually actively looking at it, <laughs> you know, whereas, you know, whereas the, the, the church historians are like digging through the things and saying, hey, what's this <laughs> all the time, you know? Yeah. Right. So I think there could be another reason that it's, it's scarcely referenced during the 19th century. Emma was extraordinarily protective of Joseph's image. She did not want it connected to polygamy or to Utah, for that matter. So, um, for example, when, when folks from the West would come visit her, she would show them the oil portrait of Joseph, but she would not allow it to be copied by them. She was very protective of the image. And, and uh, we have wondered if, if part of why they were not talking about it and not sharing it is that they wanted to carefully protect it. And my wife Kristen pointed out that that might well be why it was with the women. Nobody would think to ask the women. <laughs> <laughs> They're invisible, tragically. Um, so, uh, and, and people were asking the men. Um, Fascinating stuff, guys. You know, first of all, John Hamer, thanks for doing the solid and helping line this up. I contacted you last night around nine, ten o'clock, and we it was touch and go. And and uh, thank you for you know uh, helping arrange this. I was very happy to, and it's always wonderful to be able to talk to you and also to talk to Locke. Um, just for, couldn't couldn't be more excited with uh, the work that he and Ron have been doing. And Locke, I want to thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for coming on. I've been 
you know, I met you about a year and a half ago in the Community of Christ. We were doing the um, we we're doing the book club for Joseph Smith the Third, and that was my first foray, my first toe dip into the registration. And I remember Barbara Walden and you and the crew, and that actually helped me network out with a lot of people. Um, I just want to thank you for being so um, nice to me. Uh, I would come in every meeting and say, and there would be a hundred people on the Zoom call, like, hey, I'm your evangelical interloper, you know, and I want to apologize <laughs> on behalf of all the horrible things we've been doing to you guys for the last 200 years. <laughs> so I just want to thank you for you and Barbara and all those affiliated with the Community of Christ for making me feel at home. And I want to sure. thank you for coming on tonight. It has been truly a blessing. Love doing it. Love doing it. Thank you That's for the great. opportunity. And oh, and thank you for giving the tour at Nauvoo when I was there a few weeks ago, too. That was awesome. So, well, guys, I it's a Friday night, and I'm going to possibly post this this evening. People are really excited about it. Um, I'm excited. And uh, I want to thank you both for taking the time to do this. And uh, hopefully, hey, the next big discovery, you, you give me the props ahead of time. We could have, we could have had this all arranged beforehand. So, <laughs> <laughs> so folks, I just want to remind you to don't forget to like and subscribe and hit the notification button for when a new video comes out, just like one like tonight. Uh, you don't ever know uh, when one's going to come out. Also, just remember that there are links in the description that if you'd like to support the channel on PayPal and Patreon, as well as our merch store. Our merch store is doing very well. We're selling, surprisingly, a lot of coffee mugs. Uh, so either way, I uh, just want to thank you all for uh, staying up and enjoying this. And this is a real treat. And I'm glad that this channel is able to help uh, continue the conversation and open people's eyes and, and educate them. So thank you.